Here are the top stories. Reports say President Bush has decided who he wants to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. White House officials say an announcement could come as early as Monday. Military bases including Fort Ord in California and the Philadelphia Navy shipyard are on a final list of facilities to be closed or scaled back. The list now goes to President Bush for approval, then to Congress. Members of the American Nurses Association voted Sunday against mandatory AIDS testing. The group representing two million registered nurses says emphasis should be on education instead. The situation is still tense in Yugoslavia where two republics are still pushing for independence, but Sunday an official from one of the rebel republics was elected to a high office in the Yugoslav government, presenting a possible breakthrough in the conflict. Those are the day's top stories. I'm Dave Andrews. Sunday was a day of tough decisions in Washington. The Federal Commission deciding which military bases around the nation should be closed made several important choices. The Commission's decisions came as very painful economic news for several communities around the country where the axe has fallen. Ryan Thompson has more from Washington on the Commission's recommendations to President Bush. Fort Dix, New Jersey is one of the most famous bases of all. Hundreds of thousands of GIs got their basic training there going back decades and several wars. No more. This commission axed Dix and many others. The only consolation, a small active duty garrison to keep Dix available for future use. The world is changing. The United States military strategy must change with it. Base after base was given the bad news. Places like the huge Sacramento Army Depot with more than 3,000 civilian employees out in California, along with Fort Ord out there, and other bases in Massachusetts and Indiana. But a handful may survive. One that made it through is the only base where troops get training in real chemical weapons, Fort McClellan in Alabama. I frankly view this as a case where, uh, which happens from time to time in the defense establishment, the headquarters ain't always right. But for the bases now voted for closure, and the ones still facing that fate, this commission could only offer some small consolation about the economic hardship their communities face. But with time and initiative, communities that lose bases will reclaim prosperity. I am confident that those communities that lose bases will be able to turn that situation around, although it'll take a period of time. All of this will go to the president sometime Monday. He'll have two weeks to either approve or reject the entire list. Then, if he passes it on to Congress as expected, the House and Senate will have 45 days to do the same before it becomes law. Brian Thompson, Washington. Reports Sunday night say President Bush has decided who he wants to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Aides are making arrangements for an announcement that one official says could come before Bush returns to the White House from Maine on Tuesday. Speculation is centered on U.S. Circuit Court Judge Emilio Garza of San Antonio. White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater would only say that Garza was among the potential nominees the president is looking at. Steve Dowling has a look at other names that have been mentioned by White House observers. I don't, I mean, it, I don't know what is the most important factor. I think the important factor is to pick the best person for the job not on the basis of race one way or the other. The search is on for a new Supreme Court justice, the second to be nominated by President Bush, who is expected to continue the conservative trend on the nation's highest court. The White House has a short list of potential nominees left over from the search that produced David Souter, but the seat vacated by Thurgood Marshall will not be an easy one to fill. It's up to the president. The outgoing justice told reporters race should not be the only factor in choosing his successor, but he admitted it would be hard to ignore. In a strategic choice of words, President Bush insists there's no quota for the high court. The list of potential nominees may suggest otherwise, however. Names being mentioned in administration circles include Edith Jones, a federal appeals court judge in Texas. She interviewed for the nomination that Souter got. Clarence Thomas is a black Republican conservative in Washington, D.C., and a federal appeals court justice. Circuit Judge Amalia Kearse, a black woman appointed by Jimmy Carter, may also be considered. And Bush has the opportunity to nominate the first Hispanic justice, 
Ricardo Hinojosa is a federal trial judge in Texas, and Ferdinand Fernandez is a federal appeals court judge in Los Angeles. The decision-making process is ongoing as the president vacations in Kennebunkport. Saturday afternoon, Bush announced the field has narrowed. Two or three narrowing. It's narrowed today. Narrowed today? Yeah. Want to elaborate on that? Yeah. The White House says expect a nomination as early as Tuesday. I'm Steve Dowling reporting. And Attorney General Dick Thornburg said Sunday, President Bush will not ask his nominee for views on the Roe versus Wade abortion decision. The president has said he thinks the 1972 ruling that legalized abortion should be overturned. And a case presenting the opportunity to do so is likely to come before the court next session. But in an interview broadcast Sunday, Thornburg said Bush feels that his choice should not be based on an abortion view litmus test. Former President Reagan says he wants his 1980 campaign files searched for documents that could prove his campaign did nothing to delay the release of American hostages in Iran. Sunday morning, while leaving a church service, Reagan said allegations that his campaign tried to stall the hostage release were completely without foundation. That is why he wants to find documents that would show none of his people were involved in any scheme. The truth is uh, contrary to the lies that are being told. Several of the former hostages have asked Congress to investigate the allegations of a deal between Reagan campaign officials and Iranians to delay the hostage release until after the 1980 election. In other news, the American Nurses Association has voted against mandatory AIDS testing. During their annual convention in Kansas City on Sunday, ANA delegates overwhelmingly passed a resolution opposing such testing. The delegates who represent the nation's two million registered nurses say education is the key to stopping the spread of the deadly disease, not testing. What we know about the disease, scientifically, is what will stop the disease. Infection control and education is going to be the emphasis that we have to prioritize in this country. During the convention, delegates also outlined strict infection control procedures for health care providers. AIDS prevention policies for health professionals have come under scrutiny since Florida dentist David Aker infected five patients with the AIDS virus. Fred Treadway reports residents in a small town in Illinois are worried they may have contracted the deadly disease from the town's only dentist. The town of Nokomis, Illinois sits astride Illinois Route 16, about an hour and a half's drive from St. Louis. It's a town that has all the charm of any small town in America's heartland. So says its newly elected mayor. We have a, a relatively friendly community where everyone knows everyone. Everyone, in some cases, knows too much about everyone else's business, but that's what small rural America is all about. Nokomis, Illinois is a piece of small town America. Well, when the town's only dentist died in October of last year of pneumonia, you can understand it was quite a shock. Well, that shock value was increased a hundredfold when it was learned recently that doctor died of AIDS. That revelation, kept silent by health authorities, grabbed this town by the throat. And townspeople are angry and understandably concerned. A brother, and my mom and my dad, and friends from Missouri went to him and everything that was down here staying with us for a while. And being informed here might have helped out quite a bit. I feel the public should have known a long time before it was ever let out. I know one person went to the doctor, got an AIDS test ready. But even in this tense time for Nokomis, Mayor Cohen believes there's no reason for panic. I think that we're more susceptible of getting the AIDS virus in other ways than, than through the dentist. Uh, he, he done everything. He took every precaution that there was. But in some cases, panic has already set in. And Nokomis residents have numerous questions they want answered. Greg Treadway reporting, Nokomis, Illinois. A possible breakthrough Sunday in the crisis in Yugoslavia. A non-communist Croatian was elected to serve as chairman of the federal presidency. That could help defuse the tense conflict between the breakaway republics of Croatia and Slovenia and the federal government. But Robert Hall reports the two republics still seem bent on seceding from Yugoslavia, a move that may lead to all-out civil war in the nation. The passing of the 9 o'clock deadline brought another alert. Ljubljana's streets deserted after the first air raid warnings. This time it was a false alarm. 
but Slovenian radio has been broadcasting a list of impromptu shelters to be used in the event of further attacks. In sensitive border areas, seen of previous clashes, the ceasefire is holding. Federal troops facing continuing calls to desert rather than fight. Calls echoed by Slovenian President Kuchan, who said his country would resist any attempt by federal troops to advance beyond their present positions. In Croatia, where defence forces are also on a high state of alert, there's been no overt political support for Slovenia's hardline stand. The Croatians have problems on their southern border, where one garrison town is sealed off for fear of attacks from Serbian extremists. We all, we, we all die if we march, but this is never going to be a Serbian ground. Do you have friends among Serbians? Yes, I've got a lot of friends. Uh, I have my best friend. He was my best friend, a Serbian, but he isn't anymore. In the face of rising tension throughout northern Yugoslavia, many foreign nationals are already on their way home. A number of countries have warned that it's now unsafe to travel here. In Zagreb, they gathered for mass and to pray that some way could yet be found to avoid further bloodshed. If those prayers are to be answered, politicians on both sides must step back from the brink. They may have little time left. Robert Hall, Zagreb. <laughs> Scientists gathered in California Sunday to try to find a way to save the Earth from being hit by major asteroids. Researchers say the chances of a killer asteroid striking the Earth are extremely small. However, collisions have occurred. In 1908, an asteroid one-tenth of a mile wide hit an unpopulated area of Siberia. The blast leveled hundreds of square miles of forest with a blast equal to a thousand Hiroshima bombs. Turning now to the nation's weather radar shows an intense line of thunderstorms from North Dakota to Kansas. The storms have produced high winds, heavy rain, and hail. Farther eastward, storms are also active from the Ohio Valley into southern New England. Monday's forecast calls for hot, humid weather to hold fast over the southeast with scattered thunderstorms possible. The west will see fair, dry weather with a building heat wave. And now here's a look at Monday's forecast for selected cities across the nation. and boulders roared down a river near Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines Sunday. There were no reports of injuries, but authorities are warning villagers living near the volcano that they could expect even worse mud flows capable of burying whole towns. The volcano ed entered its fourth week of eruption Sunday, spewing ash and steam up to 33,000 feet into the air. At least 117 earthquakes have also shaken the area since Pinatubo roared to life after 600 years of inactivity. Eruptions have claimed more than 300 lives and forced more than 200,000 people to flee their homes. And in southern Japan Sunday, torrential rains swept down debris from Mount Unzen, forcing the evacuation of at least 1,200 people from their homes. Earlier in June, 41 people were killed when Mount Unzen erupted, sending an avalanche of ash and superheated rocks down the mountainside. Unzen is also the site of Japan's worst volcanic disaster. An estimated 15,000 people were killed when the mountain erupted in 1792. Scientists are still unsure what the volcano will do in the days and weeks to come. 
Here in the U.S., ancient engines were roaring to life this week in Missouri with a convention of people who own Studebaker cars. Pat Savage has the story. Nothing about these Studebakers is common, especially if you're talking to a Studebaker owner. These folks just don't like their cars, so they love them. That, that's the way she was, it was when you bought the car. And when I bought the car, it, <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the way it was. As far as I'm concerned, it's a fantasy. That piece right there, the Hulk. And it seems the next best thing to talking about your Studebaker is driving it. You can drive our brand new vehicle and nobody knows you on the road. But you can get in the Studebaker and go down the road, and everybody turns and looks to see what you're driving. More than 230 Studebakers are driving around Springfield, Missouri, this week at the 27th Annual International Studebaker Meet. There's people here from uh, Australia. Australia, Europe, Switzerland. Uh, Studebaker is just nationwide and worldwide known. People have been sharing the passion for the Studebaker for more than a century. They started making Studebakers in 1852. Back before we had motorized vehicles, they came out, did you realize that uh, President Lincoln took his last ride in a Studebaker? The hearse that he was thrown in was a Studebaker. The last car rolled off the production line in 1963, but that hasn't stopped Studebaker fans from rebuilding some of the vehicles and even building miniature versions of the car. It's a pastime that's not even beginning to back up. I'm Pat Savage reporting. Bruce Leonard with a look at sports. Baseball on Sunday night in the National League, the West leading Dodgers look to flex their muscles at the launching pad in Atlanta against the Braves. Nightmare sixth inning for Atlanta. We pick up the highlights. Gary Carter, the grounder to third. Harry Pendleton doesn't have any place to go. Chris Gwynn will score 5-3 Los Angeles. Next batter up, Lenny Harris. Lines one to right. Hal Daniels will try to score. Now the throw's going to be there in plenty of time, but Greg Olson can't handle it. Daniels will come back. He's safe. 6-3. Then Alfredo Griffin, base hit to center. Ron Gant boots it. Two more runs will score. Six errors in all in the game for Atlanta. The Dodgers win it 11-4. Elsewhere, the Chicago Cubs tried to dig themselves out of their worst slump of the season. Cubs, having lost 11-13, look to start anew against St. Louis. Key blow of the game for Chicago came here in the sixth inning. Dwight Smith with two men aboard into the seats in right. Free run shot for Smith, and the Cubs go on to get the win 7-4. In golf, Fred Couples has often been criticized for his lack of desire, but it would be hard to find fault with his performance this weekend, as Couples wins going away, taking the St. Jude Classic. Couples took control in the back nine on 16 here. He'll birdie to move to 15 under, gives him a three-shot lead. And then on 18, this to end it, Couples will roll it in and celebrates his fifth career win, taking the St. Jude Classic. Final leaderboard then looks like this. Couples on top at 15 under. Rick Fair, three shots behind in second. Jay Haas and David Knipe finished four back. Thanks to the rain, Mother Nature provided all week long. Wimbledon broke with tradition, and there was tennis being played on the middle Sunday for the first time in the tournament's 114-year history. Here some of the highlights. Top seeded Stefan Edberg Park Court moved to the fourth round with ease, dispatching Crystal Van Rensburg in straight sets. And for the women, the ninth seed, Jennifer Capriotti. She'll close out Bill Trude Prost as Prost will hit the service return wide. He wins it in three sets. Other winners of note, top seed, Savon Edberg, as I said, into the fourth round. As is number four, Jim Courier. Michael Schteek advances in four sets. For the women, number one, Steffi Graf is into round four. Ditto for number two, Gabriella Sabatini. And nine-time champion, Martina Navratilova. Other winners, Arantxa Sanchez. And number five, Mary Jo Fernandez. Back to baseball as we check all the scores. What was a busy Sunday on the diamond?